Welcome back to another episode of the RAG podcast with me, Sean Anderson, the CEO and founder of Hoxhill Media. This is the show where every single week I bring to you an interview with usually recruitment owners, sometimes advisors or suppliers or investors to this industry who are prepared to give up some of their time to talk about their story, both how they've got to where they are through growing a fast, fast growing recruitment business around the world, but also how they've navigated the pandemic and where they're going in the future. All designed to help the next generation uh, of recruitment owner in uh, around the world. So this week, I'm super excited. I'm joined by James Fernandez and Simon Gardner. These two are the founders, co-founders of Carrington West. Um, Carrington West is a specialist agency in the UK um, who specialize in technical recruitment for the built environment. And I think I've got that right. I've checked with the guy yeah, before. Yeah. We'll, we'll get into what that means uh, afterwards. Um, a few highlights about these, this, this business. Um, I, I only They came on my radar about six months ago, and I've been tracking what they're up to. They've got 62 um, staff. Um, they've been around for 10 years. And in that time, they've won numerous awards. So I'm just looking at my pad of notes, right? We've got Best startup, best medium-sized organization, best employer in their local uh, community down on the South Coast. And then the Institute of Rec Professionals um, held by the REC, they won the best company to work for up to 50 people in 2016. They then won the best medium-sized company to work for up to 250 staff in 2019. And then sat in their underpants in the pandemic, they then (laughs) won... They last year in the 2020 won the best uh, learning and development award for from the investors in people, which does not that includes every industry, every sector. You know, um, they won that up to 250 staff. Um, the winner above that was Lloyd's Bank. So that gives you a sort of an idea of the type of organisation I'm talking to, and the and you know a flavour of what what we're going to get into. So, guys, welcome to the show. Hi, thank thanks, you. Sure. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Did that intro do all right? Did I give you? Did I give you what you wanted? <laughs> oh, yeah, I think I think we might transcript that and just start using that for the website. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Very useful. Yeah, yeah one of my uh, one of my clients said, I, "I I did. I thought even though it was a podcast, I did something back for them. I explained like I was like I, I basically reworded what they said. You know, when you're trying to let them know that you understand what they've just said, and he went, "Shit." I want to use that now as our sales pitch. Like, yeah. go it, it, it kind of does help you realize what you've achieved throughout the years because it, sometimes it's really hard, right? And we're, we're going to get into that. But looking back, I think it's it's always worth doing and mm. to recognize, yeah, some of the achievements we've had. So, yeah, it's great. Right, so do me, I've, I've done your intro, but can you give me an individual intro of who you guys are, what your role is in the business? Start with you, James. Right, yes. So obviously co-founder with Simon, um, but also the, the current MD. Uh, have been at the MD for two to three years now, isn't that right, Simon? I think yeah. I've forgotten. I think it was. I think, and, I think it was April. Was it April three years ago? Yes. Yeah. Yep. So, so um, yeah. So as, as the business was growing, um, we needed someone to sort of step more into into that kind of focal point um, to keep moving the business along and making sure. Maybe we, we were kind of looking above the parapet, I suppose, or. A bit more of the future rather than being on the coal face and the nitty gritty. So that's essentially my role, trying to set the, the speed and direction of the business um, and managing the uh, the directors and trying to build a really effective team, setting some big priorities for the business uh, and ensuring the operations can cope, essentially. Makes sense. Great. Simon? Yeah. So, I mean, as, as James hit the nail on the head there, up until sort of two and a half, three years ago, we were very much, um, you know, all kind of level playing field in terms of the hierarchy. Um, You know, I mean, the business wasn't run by committee as such, but everyone had an equal say. And obviously, uh, James and I co-founded, but um, quite soon after, um, Nick Rowe and Alex Kerr came on board as partners. Um, And then since then, we've we've added three more directors. So it was very much a sort of committee-based, you know, um, kind of, uh, kind of best intended, but we we, we kind of muddled through. We, we, we obviously muddled through very successfully. But James was right. We we did need a managing director. That was raised initially by the by the finance director that we brought in. Mm-hmm. Um, so, kind of up until that point, it was we we just sort of took on sort of sort of teams to manage, but then unofficial roles within the business. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, James was very much the, the, the you know as he as he mentioned, head above the parapet. What's next? You know, kind of ensuring the next kind of legislation change or, or whatever what didn't affect us too 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 all, um, all, all the fun stuff Sean. All, all the fun yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and then you know conversely to that my my fun stuff was, was was a bit more detailed so it was kind of the crm 
um you know i was i was the go-to to to kind of train people annoyingly even even now i get questions but about that um <laughs> and um yeah I'm very much systems and processes, but you know these days it is it's much clearer in terms of its hierarchy. James is the managing director. Um, myself, Nick, Alex, Blaine Cahill, who was actually our sort of first um, kind of uh, consultant, if you like, is is now mm-hmm. is he he's a, probably our biggest success story. He's now a director in his own right, and um, and we've got Joe Yates, who who who's the director of, of, of buildings, and, and Gavin obviously manages the financial side. So. We all we all sort of feed into James and 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 essentially we have teams to manage and um right. you know we, we we refer to that as our first team so things have got a, more, a lot more formalised in the last two or three years. Yeah. Well, that makes sense and uh, you know I, I probably we've had a change at my business so my my business partner and I you know we've got quite a complementary skill set. Amma Amma is more like yourself. I think James is is like the guy who makes. I, I just think he gets shit done like across any area. Like he, you give him a task and he'll, he solves the problem. Whereas mm-hmm. I've always lent towards marketing, content, sales, brand. And, you know, I have loads of ideas. I'm not sure I'd always make sure they'd, they'd happen. So he's, he's the guy who makes sure that he keeps me grounded. But it's a good, it's a good band. So I get it. Um, mm-hmm. so let's go back. How did you guys get to know each other? If you started the business 10 years ago, where did the, the relationship start? Um, yeah, shall I take this one? So, yeah, we both worked for a large technical recruiter uh, down the road from where, where we are now um, in the same team. And... I think we were working for this huge uh, business that had floated and other bits and pieces. And we kind of felt it was going in the wrong direction. It wasn't being run for its staff or for even its clients. It was for the shareholders. Um, and so we felt we, we, the company was on a journey that we didn't really believe in. And so, yeah, uh, we did probably spend almost a year planning our exit from there. Didn't we? Um, it, and, you know, these things, they seem to take their time. Um, until eventually, and Simon's mentioned this recently to me, actually, I kind of, I handed my notice in uh, unexpectedly for Simon um, because I was, I'd had <laughs> enough of planning. For everybody. <laughs> yeah, I'd had enough of planning and we were like, if we don't, we just need a jump now. You can keep yeah. planning and rewriting things, but Dez, you've got to take a jump and that's what entrepreneurial this is. And so, yeah, I took the jump um, and then, just kept badgering Simon until he quit as well. And, yeah. uh, I'd just yeah. like to, and as a we caveat to that, James didn't want to do his end of year review. So, um, <laughs> you know, putting it off, putting it off and, and just, you know, kind of walked in and, and, and quit. I was actually, but, at the, I was actually at, at, at the cinema that day and I'd come out to, you know, you turn your phone on, there's loads of, you know, missed, missed calls. And um, yeah, he, he'd quit probably about three months earlier than we'd planned. So, mm-hmm. you know, we did, we didn't have, you know, necessarily the, 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 the right funds personally to keep going, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, James is very right. Someone's got to do something and, you know, we are, you know, integrity runs for our, our, our organisation. That's why we've grown. And and it starts with the, you know, obviously the senior leadership team. And, you know, James isn't going to go into to, to an end of year review and plan and, and promise to be there when obviously he, you know, mm-hmm. that, 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 that obviously wasn't the intention. So what, so. what roles were you in at the time, James? What were, you, were you leading the team? Um, I was sort of lead team leader. Yeah. Um, but I think my team was two. So right. it was... Uh, yeah, we were kind of all in it together. But yeah, so I've brilliant. been there a few years between uh, before side. So were you still billing at the time of leaving? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was probably my problem. So I, I planned a recruitment company for two years and Amma joined me at the point of two years and, and we worked together and we built this plan and plan and plan. Hoxo was a recruitment company at the time. And I'd not been billing in that final year, really. I did the odd one. Okay. I did it. I yeah. the biggest deal ever in that year, but I didn't, you know, my job was about hiring recruiters, training and BD yeah. and stuff. So I think that was a, one of the factors that kept holding us back was, you know, we were at different points. Mm. I wanted one thing, he wanted another. He was doing one job, I was doing it. It just didn't feel like we were both at the same point for a long time. Um, and it was actually him, I think, that was like, if we don't fucking quit, we're never going to quit. Because I'd had this big contract book that was just paying me great comms every month. Mm. So I was like, oh, it's very hard to walk away from it. Yeah, <laughs> we, we, we had the same. And we had even the company cars and things that we had to ha- yeah. hand back. And for the first 18 months, I couldn't afford a new car. I had to get yeah. the train into Fratton every day to, our, to the garage that we were working in. And I remember that Tom's got a good story. The first car he bought for £250 after he had to hand his um, company car back had no power steering some really weird <laughs> immobilizer it used to pick me up from fratton station oh, but I trying to parallel park really good <laughs> as arms to work out yeah. and you know people would would almost laugh at the car 
but yeah, you, you've, you've got to do those things. And mobile, it, it was a great that, thing. That brought back yeah. memories. Mobilizer. We had a we had a Ford Escort with a mobilizer when I grew up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> car that. So what? Where did the name come from, Carrington West? What's that about? Um, great question. We we are often asked this. Um, mm. We actually there there was a I, I think. Um, I mean, you know, the, the the kind of first version of our of our business had had a sort of catchphrase or, or a nickname, which was just a cheesy recruitment company, which is also which was almost code that we could talk about it at the desk sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. But when we when we started to formalise the name, one of our colleagues' brothers worked, I believe, in a, in a garage which was Carrington Garages, and he, and he mentioned it, and it sort of kind of resonated. Um, and then I think James came up with it you know came up with something a bit punchier for the, for, for, yeah. for the kind of second I, half of it I, we, we had a bit of a formula so it's essentially made up right um yeah. we didn't want to go fernandez gardner recruitment you know don't want to make it about yourself e ego is the enemy and all that yeah. and we didn't want one of these um apprentice type names you know apollo recruitment you know that sort of thing i thought it sounds cheesy apologies to apollo recruitment yeah <laughs> <laughs> if, if there you're is getting a letter. you're getting a legal letter, like, yeah. <laughs> Um, and so we wanted something that sounded a bit more established. We didn't really want recruitment in the name because obviously you can, mm. you know, you can break down a few of the barriers a bit easier. Um, and the domain was free, so yeah, okay. why not? I like it. But you could yeah. be you if you said it was James West and Simon Carrington, you'd you'd think it was right. Yeah, so, but, Matt, I, I think, think maybe we need we need a better story. You yeah. could have pretended they were like your investors or advisors or something, or the bosses mm. that you were working for. You know. That's it. Yeah. I, I was going to say my, my my only piece of advice because because I know you know new startups do listen to this and things, and if you if you haven't taken the leap yet, um, my only piece of advice wouldn't be to name your company after the industry necessarily that you're going to go into. Um, you know, we we do see a lot of. Um, you know, uh, quite niche, quite niche names. And when someone comes along and they've left their company and they're not quite in your in your space, but it's it it, it would complement. You've then got a branding issue, and so yeah. to future proof your your name, it needs to be something not generic for generic sake, but something that can be multi discipline. If if that's you know kind of the direction great you take. Yeah, yeah, great advice. I think it is an actual quite a painful process for a lot of people. The name, like it can paralyze people. Like, don't like that. Don't like that. Um, so, all right, take us back, paint the picture. You mentioned the word garage, so I'm excited. So tell me, January 2011, I know where I was. I was in Thailand, absolutely nice. boozed, boozed off my nut at the full moon party till about the 4th of January 20, 2011. That was the year I went traveling and ended up in Australia in recruitment. So tell us, paint the picture of your startup story. Um, yeah, so, so it was obviously by the time he uh, managed to convince Simon to leave, uh, once, once he'd lined up his ducks, um, we moved into our uh, 3rd of January, 2011, moved into Simon's brother, brother's, uh, converted garage. Um, he, he didn't let us put the heating on, but we had two camping tables. <laughs> he, he denies this, but we know this is fact. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He does. We, we had fingerless gloves and our own laptops, which were a little bit, um, terrible at the time, but yeah. fold out camping tables that we used to have to fold away at the end of each day. Um, oh. a couple of doddy chairs. And and that was it, and just a lot of enthusiasm. And without that, we wouldn't have got through because that was. Did you need was like? Tough that, did you time. need to get like phones wired in and car like internet lines and stuff? We, yeah. we did actually. He he had internet, I believe, but we we needed yeah you know old school BT came and drilled into our little yeah. section of the room. But so he he's got a quite a successful um quite a successful security company. But during that year, he'd um, he'd he'd kind of moved into more of the of the, of the training of the security guards and the and the qualifications you need. So J James was very right on the you know every other week our little room was used to actually train people. So then we had to kind of pick up our our computers and move into the main room where my brother's uh, pet dog and you know kid, <laughs> kids and my, my parents and other and other security guards would turn up and collect their wages and recount you know. Uh, wow. st stories of the Saturday night, and we're you know, we're on the phone to you know Wolf and Forest or somewhere, um, <laughs> you know, trying to do something official. But it, it was actually, do you know what? It, it it was it was good times, and um, although we didn't get paid for for fourteen months, and and I've recently just put this on on on, on my Instagram page. You know, it's actually you, you don't realise you know how, how tough things are but you don't realize how much you're actually enjoying it um yeah. and, and it's and it's the natural challenge and yeah he would come in and turn the heating off and he, and he would charge us for you know um kind of everything um in terms of fuel it, it was, i mean it was all it was it was all free but you know oh, we, we, we 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 placed a few people and gave them a free computer as we left sort of yeah. thing but we were only supposed to be there three or four weeks and we ended up there 
um, until the February 2012. So we were actually mm. there for 13 months. Wow. Um, you said you didn't get paid for 14 months. We, no. we, we didn't take a salary for 14 right. months. Right. I was like, okay. Well, you um, did. What was the, so talk me through that first year. You're in there, you know, you're on your own laptops. You're not got the heating on. Hopefully by the summer, it was a bit better. It'd probably boiling then in too, a garage. Too hot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like a, in a garage. Yeah. Um, so what, what was you like? What, how did you split what you guys did back then? Um, well, I think we were, we were very focused on, um, on trying to, trying to build. So that, that, that was, that's the primary focus. The setup of the CRM and the other insurances kind of almost split down the middle, didn't we, Simon? I think just whatever came in, whoever maybe had a bit more time would jump on it. And so you have to wear so many hats and you always hear uh, startups saying that. Um, and so yeah, we just had to do that. But I, I think the hardest thing for us was just to keep the, the motivation up and enthusiasm because we kind of we knew where we were heading and we knew what we wanted and we believed in our, ourselves and our process. But at times it's pissing down with rain and you're like, oh, you know, you're trying to make another hundred calls to people who don't want to speak to you because you're a brand new name that no one's ever heard of. It's tough. So um, so you really need, and this is sort of one of my big takeaways from all of this, one lesson is that you, you can't do it alone. Um, I don't think I would have succeeded without Simon and, I'm, or, and as the other directors joined as well. Hopefully you'd say the same, but yeah. everybody needs support a crutch when things are going badly just to you know continue the belief um and yeah well i think we were very lucky for that reason weren't we Simon? yeah totally i think you know you, you do see companies of of you know kind of one single kind of founder owner and they and you know so, some some explode obviously but you know especially in the recruitment space they um they they, they can plateau and I, and i think it's i think a lot of it is just to unload on someone that kind of understands and you end up dovetailing each other in terms of mm. skills obviously you mentioned with your business partner there sean but you also dovetail each other in terms of motivation and you know things you know, motivation does does dip and you do become disillusioned with it and then and then you know and then you take over as the other person so you you you, you kind of you know fight the good fight every day together yeah um, like and and and, and yeah i was gonna say and and you know obviously nick and alex and and later blaine you know they 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 offer each other what me and James offer in terms of complementary kind of personalities and drive as well. So, you know, together as a four and then, and then as a five and now as a seven, it's, it's, yeah, it's just taken off. Mm. So what was the lowest moment in that year? Can you remember like a rock bottom year one moment? Yeah. My, my lowest moment is I couldn't afford my train fare to get into Fratton. Um, <sighs> Cause I just, I'd run out of money completely. And yeah, and that, that, that was pretty low. Yeah. Um, I, I then used the, the company card, which was just full of Simon and I, our, our, my money anyway, sort of our float. Yeah. But there wasn't a lot yeah. in there to get to the office. Embarrassingly, said Simon, I'm sorry, I've just had to pay for my train ticket. Um, this is this is getting tough. And I think I, year, year, a couple of years later, Simon confessed to me there was a point where he was like, I just don't think this is working. Uh, I yeah. think we've got to go and find jobs. Where, where was? Can you remember when that was, Simon? Um, I mean, you know, as as you know, the early year optimism turns into sort of, you know, Easter grind and then all of a sudden it's summer and then, and, and, you know, we, we, we were billing, um, and, and, and doing okay. The, the issue was we didn't want to, we didn't want to be those guys that broke our post terms, you know, our, our previous company for all of their misgivings were, uh, you know, a decent company to work for. And, you know, at the time in terms of training and, you know, we still had some personal relationships there. So we actually, for the first six months did ad hoc recruitment outside of our sector which we were allowed yeah. to do for friends and friends of friends and you know we were we were looking at one stage for a lot of romanian speaking pa for orange <laughs> and then we were doing something else for a, for a, um uh did you feel that job did you feel that job yeah we, we, we feel we feel a few actually oh, in fact no. i think it's our record ever placement was um go on james was it because i think you were uh, you... Uh, head, head council at uh orange yeah yeah wow. which was really we, out of our comfort zone but yeah it shows you, you can do and it then, if, you, we, if you put your mind to it yeah. and then we dive straight back into sort of the local authority kind of high raise market where there's, where yeah. there's no margins <laughs> but <laughs> um no it, I, I think the toughest moment for me was we, we we took our first employee on 
Um, and we, he was actually our sort of more senior guy at our previous company. Um, mm. He then moved on um, and, 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 and kind of recruited in a separate industry, but he, he then became available again about six months after. So we thought, you know, he was an absolute no brainer um, and, and he joined us. And for whatever reason, it, it, it was, you know, he was still the same great, great guy, but as a dynamic, as a three, I, it, it didn't quite work out. So it was actually two or three days before Christmas. He just had his first child um and you know the, the money that we were about to start paying ourselves on month six or seven and i'm talking 500 pound a month you know we we'd we'd found some more and pulled it together and offered him the salary um and about two or three days before christmas we actually had to kind of you know we, we there was there was no choice we'd, we'd run out of money mm -hmm. um so that 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 wasn't that wasn't a nice end to the first year basically but mm -hmm. um you know from, from from there it from there it picked up and and there was a big issue with one of our um sort of main rpo clients where we we hadn't allocated the, the funds or, or the the, out, the company that we'd outsourced it to hadn't actually allocated two hundred thousand pounds worth of, of of contract invoices properly so that that was sat all disapproved on the on the system so we that, that, that that goes to show you just don't know what you don't know we yeah. thought we had it in hand and we we're not financial directors but you have to you have to wear that hat and that's yeah. probably one of our biggest errors wasn't it simon where we suddenly, well, we were trying to move our, it was our factoring invoice discounting account. And um, someone flagged up, well, you haven't allocated like these £200,000 worth of invoices. We didn't know we had to do that. <laughs> we, we thought it was being done for us. Yeah. We said, no, 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 that's not our job. And, oh, my God, that was a week worth of very painful spreadsheeting, wasn't it, Simon? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that was not fun. No. Yeah. So and I think, like I think that probably cost us twenty to £30,000, didn't it? I'm interrupting this episode of the RAG podcast to bring you a message from our sponsor, Audro. You know by now that Audro are the number one video interview platform for recruiters around the world. Now, they keep bringing out new features from Audro Capture to Audro Producer, and it just keeps getting better and better and better. But now, recently, they've just announced a new feature to the platform, which is a complete game changer. During COVID-19, they realized that the recruitment audience the communication was changing. Globally, their clients and candidates were, were using Microsoft Teams and Zoom more than anything else. The phrase, let's jump on a Zoom call or jump on a Teams call has actually replaced the, the words video interview for a lot of their conversations over the last six months. Now, they were thinking, do we, I mean, how are we going to er eradicate this? How are we going to make Audro the name that everyone talks about for, for the interview process? And they realized they didn't need to. They needed to integrate. So for the first time ever, they, they're the first video interview platform on the planet that have decided and managed to integrate with Zoom and soon to be integrated with Microsoft Teams. So with one click after recording a Zoom video, you can now drag that into Audro and create everything else that Audro has from adding the CV, the heat maps, the capture and the producer elements. You get all the benefits of Audro before and after the interview, but you get to use Zoom, which is client friendly on all levels. So this is massive. Teams is coming. It's the first time anyone's ever done it in our sector, and it is literally going to change the way you work in 2021. Get in touch with my friends over at Audro at audro.co.uk, or if you're already a user, reach out to your account manager to make sure you've got this feature. Back to the show. So the yeah. end of the year, end of year one, beginning of year two, you go into, um, you, you leave the, the, the garage. So you leave the garage and then you talked about, was that the same point you started thinking about bringing the directors in for the guys? It thing? was so we we actually thought right something needs to change and and you know we we, we changed our environment and we we took um a, a, essentially a broom cupboard in you know the, probably the nicest building in the nicest business park in the in the area um and and you know if you read James Khan's book he he essentially did the same thing and it's um you know it it, it made us you know I, I mean I, st I still I still were driving here in the 250 pound car um yeah. but we we, <laughs> drove, we drove with the visors down so that no one would recognize us yeah. um, and that is a true story but we but but, but, but we came here in the February um and then Nick and Al kind of um ha had left the, the same previous company and they gave us a call in the summer and they wanted essentially advice to to you know do something similar but in their yeah. niche um which was complementary but but non-competing um and um yeah that that's that's how that kind of marriage if you like started mm -hmm. that's that, how those conversations took place um but you know we, mm -hmm. we we've been here which is lakeside in portsmouth and um 
you know, we we I think they took down a wall for us uh, in the in the sort of flexi offices downstairs. Then a second wall, then I think a third wall, which was good, but it was a south facing side of the building, and it was so it was one one room deep and about six windows wide. So it was an absolute um, concern. Yeah. 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 Um, and then we've dotted around and we've ended up in the, in the office that we've that we've ended up in. Uh, well, let's go. Let's, so you bring those guys. So was it just you two when when you brought those in, or did you have any employees in in your niche? It was just us two. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We 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 we'd, we'd, we'd had we we'd had the first one, but then dropped back down to two at the Christmas. So it was still yeah, still two. So did you have to restructure the the share? shareholders agreements and like that to bring them up. um so yes. without giving huge amounts away obviously commercially uh, sensitive yeah. uh, they sort of had share options which they vested very quickly it was a uh, performance related and they um i think it was over two years which they did in a year so yeah. that was great yeah, yeah and, it, and it did it did give us it really helped us um sort of uh speed up the process so Simon and I, for the first year and a bit we, we you had to spend a lot of time on the process getting the finance right so when those guys came in who were both great at their jobs, they almost just had the platform and were able to start go billing. Whereas kind of we had to build that as we went, so we were a bit slower. Um, but their billings then allowed us to bring in more people. And so this was the Blaine Carhill who came in. Did he come in as senior consultant or consultant? I think he came in as senior. Um, senior, and he, he's now obviously gone through the ranks. He's been our, been our biggest billing thing. But that allowed us to bring people in. And then start scaling, and that was almost the start of of the journey. Because did you always when, know you want to grow a people driven company? Like, did you always see that fifty, sixty? Yeah, yeah. I, I I think that's one thing that um, kept us going in the early days, or especially me. I I always have a a big vision. I'm very ambitious, but also very optimistic. I'm like, this is all going to go brilliantly, and um, and so uh, Simon's very big on this. Every, every system we employed. We, we always said, is this scalable? So our CRM, can this do up to or plus 100 staff? Will this, will this be fit for purpose? So every system we created had that in mind, um, which I think has really saved us probably time and money as we've grown not to have to replace things. Hmm. Yeah, totally. And, and, and you know, James is very big on the vision and we, we used to treat ourselves every Friday to, to a harvester basically and we used to have our sort of um, you know, wrap up well you know we, we you know if we fill a job and it's seven pound for a bit of chicken um, <laughs> and, and and we sort of sat there and we got to wait, know all the waitresses as well and we you know and they'd overhear our conversations and they were like yeah we're gonna we're gonna build a big company um, but J James was very you know Yes, I, yes, I went along with it, and I did believe we'd, we'd get there. Did I think we would get there as quickly as James was maybe saying, maybe not? Um, but, you know, we we were there, and we'd we'd filled three or four jobs, and we and he he's got a bit of paper, and he's drawn out sort of a structure of thirty people, and it's just like yeah. you know. Um, but but that I'm I'm a firm believer in you know if you if you you know some people do want a lifestyle business, and and that's fine, and there are some successful recruitment companies that keep it at four or five, and that and that's yeah, that's yeah. the goals, but. You know, we, we wanted to grow something bigger um, and, and um, you know, we wanted to offer opportunity. And I think as a as a founder of a business that's got those goals, you, you owe it to the people that come in for your dream to be so big and so vast that they can see their whole life and their career and their partner and how their kids are going to, you know, do what they need to do inside of your dream, yeah. if that makes we, sense. We've always said, it's, like, it's a bit of a mantra, um, and this is from, I think, uh, very early um, audio book I read, I, I used to sort of get really into my audio books whilst on, on the train into Fratton, was um, you've got to give them a cathedral. So you probably heard the, um, the fable uh, about the stonemason building a wall and you ask him, what are you doing? He's laying bricks. You ask the next guy who's doing the same thing, what are you doing? I'm building a wall. The last guy is doing exactly the same job. What are you doing? I'm building a cathedral. So the same guy doing, or oh, three different people doing the same job, if, you, if, if they're building a cathedral, they'll get up early, they'll stay late, they'll have a lot more pride in their work. And so we used to live on that mantra, give them a cathedral. They're part of something bigger. And we did passionately believe that. And we're saying we're going places. And now it's, it's actually quite easy to keep people enthused, motivated and happy at work if they know that they're working towards something bigger. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. We, how far ahead? How far ahead? Good, good point. I mean, I, I love that. I've never actually heard that before, that oh, fable. Yeah. Crap, you give me something. Um, yeah. What, what, how far ahead would you communicate that that vision? Like you, so I, I'm a, I'm a believer of like one to one year and three years. They're the kind of two markers. Anything beyond that might be in my head, but I'm not 
putting that out to the team because I, I just think it's too far personally. But what how do, what sort of standard do you live by with that? Um, James, that's probably the best one for you because that's essential yeah. now, isn't it? Yeah, so um, I, I think sort of uh, the SLT, our senior leadership team, we probably are working on a three to five year plan. Um, and we do make everyone aware of our grander ambitions. So our grander am- ambition is to be the best we can possibly be. That's as an employer, but also within our sectors. And we can really only do that within our sectors if we have enough people to actually you know, dominate and, and do a good job. So we do communicate that. But when it comes down to nitty gritty, we probably break it down to a one year plan. Um, so we have a vision for that. And we have three main goals under that vision that, that achieve, achieve our, our overall vision, which comes together from, from everybody. Then you have a number of objectives to achieve each goal. So that's how we do it. We call it a one, three, five plan. Right. Um, so most teams have got individual ones. We've got a business one and we communicate these all the time. So before every meeting, the SLT have, so we meet just on a fortnightly basis at the moment, we make sure we read through that, we clarify. And having that vision, and that's just 2021 vision, um, that helps make uh, all of our decisions easier because you're like, does this help us get to our vision? So, you know, um, and it helps drive, help, helps inspire because you write it in, in the present tense um, and, you, and you also write what it means to you to achieve that. So we want to become... We want to be recognised as the best employer in in uh, in, in uh, uh, the South Coast. We want to be um, growing our clients, this, that, the other. So, and then you say this will allow me to be very proud of the place that I work. So that inspires you every day to to keep mm-hmm. going, work harder, and because um, you know recruitment's tough. Um, you, yeah. you know you need something extra. It's not you know money doesn't really get you through those days. Mm-hmm. It's got to be something more. How long were you guys? Billing, or you know, maybe you're both. You're still billing, Simon. I'm not sure. But how long were you hands on? And then when did you start thinking about taking your foot off the gas and, and actually looking at the business and working on the business? That's a great question, and probably you know a battle that most people have yeah. either faced if they're at our stage or, or will face. I'm sure if you, if you if you're just starting. But um, I think I feel by our last job, and I was looking the other day, 2016. Right. Um, but it starts to really tail off, you know. So essentially, we were, you know, I mean, even up until you've got a company of 30 people, you know, the, the co-founders are still essentially only team leaders, especially if there's five or six of you. Yeah. You can obviously work out kind of the numbers. And then from there, you know, more serious responsibilities take place. And people look to you not to pass them a CV. They look to you to say, where's my career going? So yeah. it's, uh, you, you, you know, so I, I think the sooner that you can financially um deal with that as a, as a business you need you, you know you owe it to your team members um and and your and, and the people that you want to attract to, to 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 come off the tools essentially now that doesn't mean that you're you know old candidates and old clients i'm friends with a few on facebook there they still want to still still want a bit of my time um what one, one called in the other day and he, and he you know wanted to kind of join a, a, a local authority up north and i sort of passed it over so you've still got that connection you still want to add value in terms of the sales but you're not process the placements on you know mm. obviously on the system and things and then um, yeah so um f- for me about four or five years ago and, and i think yeah. for james probably probably six months prior to that yeah there's one thing we try and measure with our with our directors is that if if you build full time you, you'd build this but if you spent that whole time managing six people would they be able to build more because of it and and we we believe yes so when you hit that turning point um yeah, that's when we kind of turn turn the billing tap off. So, is there a trigger then? Is there an is there a, is it is it a number of people you're managing, or is there something you would say in your business triggers you probably are going to be more hands off? No, I, I think each sector is very different. Yes. Um, one of our directors, Alex, was probably billing up to about a year and a half ago, maybe. Um, but it, it depends on the teams and the sector that you're dealing with. I think it, it is very different. There's no rule. Yeah. Well, so tell me, talk me through the trajectory then. So you, you know, we got up to about year two, year three, when you were you're in that office. It's like a greenhouse, and you started knocking yeah. walls down. How did the was your headcount growth like a linear year on year? Was everything going up each year? Or did you have any dips or plateau points along the way? Um, um, go I, on, I, go I always think, yeah. Sorry, there's it's that's an interesting thing that I've looked at before and and or spoken to others about. There are always plateaus. I think every sector or industry is going to be different but kind of you get to about 12 and you're all really good friends your mates everyone's on the tools at that point you probably need some self-support 
uh, compliance, HR or finance. So you start bringing in those people to be able to then um, keep accelerating. So you kind of plateau at 12, not for long, for, for a quarter or two. Then you go, right, actually, we can't grow anymore. So you need to then put some back office in place. Then you can go up to about 20. At that point, again, you need to, you need more time as managers. Uh, as Simon's saying, you know, you, you team leader to manager to director. Um, then once you've got that sorted out, you can then accelerate again. So it's never linear. It's kind of up to a plateau, up to a plateau, as long as you invest in your back office, I suppose, or even your mindset. Because we, we've all had to change our mindsets from being a recruiter where you know, it's almost a bit of a selfish job and it's, you know, um, busyness breeds business and you don't think about, you know, you don't stop to think about things to the point, all right, actually, we're leaders now. We need to behave differently. So we need to evolve that mindset. We need to focus on training, bringing HR and a, and a learning and development platform and other bits and pieces. So, yeah, that's up to, so I think, 12. Then we had 20. Then probably about the 35, 40 was another bit of a plateau. Mm-hmm. About um, 60 has been another plateau for us, but that may have been a bit of COVID coming in as well. So we have uh, we did grow last year um, in headcount, but maybe not as much as we wanted, obviously. So it's, it's, it's a in- really interesting question because I think most businesses have very, very similar growth, growth um, patterns. Yeah, and, and, and that's it. And, and, and James is very right. And, you know, <clears throat> we're obviously quite crudely talking about headcount in, in just terms of numbers. But here, you know, each one of those people have got, you know, motivations, hopes, dreams and, and things that we need to support them with. So we don't want to just take on anyone and, and you know, give them three months and sink or swim. Yeah. You know, we're, we're investing a huge amount of time. Um, you know, some some recruitment businesses and we, you know, me and James have been on some training courses and, and we've met some interesting, you know, recruitment owners um, who sort of turn up in flashy cars and have got, you know, companies of three or four and, the, and, the, and they can't seem to grow it. Um, you know, some people look after themselves as owners. Some people look after the clients. We're here. We look after our staff and obviously the that's that's you know obviously if you just cast your eye down the awards list that that will show you um you know aside from just the company awards most individual you know kind of top performers here have have also won national awards and we support that so you know we it's it's consistent growth but it's considered growth because you know we we Mm. owe that to each person so how do you do it then so talk me through like some of the strategies or methods or you know things you've put in place that enable you to ensure that you are people first because it's a it's a phrase that gets banded around yeah of of people say it but it's very rare that i hear anything different around what people yeah no i i think you're completely right i think there's certain things that we do to make sure that kind of uh we put people first i mean you've got to celebrate their successes that's one thing you've got to praise we do all of the um the survey satisfaction surveys and actually really listen to people and we report back on that and make some changes. So flexible work and work from home, um, you know, all the way down to dress code. So, you know, we can consult on that, which I think is really good for engagement. Um, but our attention has been fantastic. We've been able to grow, I think, better than most others because our attention is great. We, we have more than 90% retention, whereas a lot of recruitment companies might have 50%. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we, we never really lose anyone that we don't want to. I don't think we have. Um and so, yeah, our retention is fantastic. And we spend so much time to make sure people are happy. When they come in, every one of our consultants is given a four-year plan. So this is what you will be expected to build every day for the next four years. This is what you will earn from it. These are the times when you'll get promoted. Um, and we have very, some very good structures within that. But only over the last couple of years, as we, again, we got to a size we made learn and development probably our focus. Again, we understand that people want to grow as people professionally as well. So we've got a learn and development platform, which we invested a lot of money in, and the directors are great as well at sort of pushing that, but also doing some classroom stuff. So people feel they're coming in every day and getting better at their jobs. A final interruption to today's episode to introduce Vincere. Vincere is the all-in-one CRM ATS platform built for the recruitment and staffing industry. Now, I first heard about these guys about a year ago. The amount of prospect recruitment agencies and clients I was working with that were telling me they were moving over to Vincere, I had to look into it. And what I found was a business that had a global reach um, with multiple offices around the world. So they've got this follow the sun methodology, which allows them to support recruitment businesses wherever you are and, have, and, and be in your time zone. 
but the technology that they've invested in um, is becoming a, a disruptor in the space. More and more recruitment businesses are, are doing this to give their, their recruiters a competitive advantage. They broke into the G2 crowd's momentum grid as a market leader based on their reviews from their customers. So the, the agencies that are using this platform are raving about it. Now, if you're a rag listener and you're thinking about changing CRM or you're a new business looking to launch with a new CRM, then I would get in touch with, the, with these guys because if you mention that you're a rag listener, they're doing an amazing deal. By visiting www.vincere.io forward slash rag, you can get an exclusive deal which offers two months completely free on a two-year commitment or three months completely free on a three-year commitment. This applies to all licenses that you've either signed up for now or that you'll add in the duration of the contract. So get on there and have a look. Finally, if you're listening to your recruiter and you're thinking, I want to move into a more of a business development role um, and I'd like to keep hold of my recruitment knowledge. Well, these guys are recruiting for a BD person, well, multiple roles in both Sydney and London right now. So if you've got a strong recruitment background, you want to move into BD and you want to work for a fast moving tech business that's helping people like you right now, then get in touch via their website because they're hiring today. Back to the show. Do you bring in people without experience now? Are you able to do that? And that, that's, the, that's the majority of what we bring in now. Yeah. Yeah. I think when you go for the big agencies that, be, that tend to grow do have to build that layer of infrastructure to be able to train rookies. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if you're just chasing the experienced people forever, you're uh, the two. Yeah, and the, the early days, we, you have you have to take experienced people because you know we, we Simon and I and the other directors are billing, so we haven't got time to do all the training. Mm. The problem we found with that is that quite often you've got to get them to unlearn what they've learned elsewhere because it's never at to our standard or the way that we want to do it, obviously. But um, yeah, so we almost battle to make them unlearn and then relearn, which mm. I think is is tough. So getting sort of fresh grads or people with some sales experience um, seems to be kind of the way that it's working much better for us. But now we've got the, the resources in-house um, to train them really, really well. Mm. What, about what about attracting them? Are you doing that yourself or do you, have, do you use external agencies for that? We, we have done in the past. Um, but, you know, I, I think most sort of hotspots, recruitment hotspots, and there seems to be one in the south, you know, quite a few have, have, have popped up. And, you know, there are some career recruiters, aren't there? And, and, I, th and I think, um, but there are some good rector -rex out there. And, and you know, we, we always welcome sort of, you know, discussions with, with, with good ones, phone James, not me. Um, but um, we, we've, we've recently taken on and, and invested in like an HR department and, uh, you, you know, and, and that and that. That function is very, very good. You know, at, at taking on the internal recruitment, we've completely torn up um, the, the 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 way that we bring people in. So we've got you know uh, personality tests. We've got you know a set process for this, um, and 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 then you know it goes into the onboarding and in, in, into the training as well. You know, it's not just you know obviously as as we all know, recruitment process isn't just from 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 the from the initial requirement to, to day one. It's actually probably you know the whole first eighteen months, isn't it? Mm. Um, and um, so yeah, so so we've it, it's it's more internal now, and and you know you know Zoom and and, and the initial meeting um, kind of online is it's been a godsend really because you you, you know you, you can you can chat to eight or nine people a day rather than mm. you know ask someone to come for you know for, forty miles from yeah. each other. I was going to ask you how was how was your business <laughs> different before the pandemic? That was going to be my next question. What yeah. was the way you conducted the the whole thing compared to when the world went remote? Um, again, that's, that's, that's probably a good, it's probably a good question for James. You know, we, we've, we, we certainly lent on our culture, um, yeah. and you know, we, we, we put, you know, a, a huge amount of trust in our staff, which we already had. Um, and, and to be honest, the results have been, you know, really, really good. Um, it, 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 it is easy to trust your staff when, when we've hired well on attitude, they, um, and again, I know lots of companies talk about their values and, and how well, taken up by their people i passionately believe that they do we call it the current rest pie passion integrity and excellence and um but in lots of stages we ask people you know on their quarterly reviews even weekly meetings um you know what does it mean to you what does passion mean to you how do you think you display it and everybody in the business is passionate about being the best that they could possibly be they've got integrity because we're, we're about the long term we don't hire recruiters who I only want to do six months, screw everyone over and bugger off. Um, but and then obviously excellence speaks for itself because if you're second in recruitment, uh, you don't get any money. 
So people do really believe in that. So we were able to lean on our culture and our trust because we knew that they, they bought into that. And you cut their arm off like a sick of rock and you'd see it going through uh, the bone marrow. So yeah, we, le- we lent on that and we, we completely flipped um, what we were doing, I think, just as a pandemic. We, we very quickly recognised well-being, engagement was, was our only job as directors. We knew we weren't really going to build very much. We took a very potentially risky decision to just invest in our staff. So the day that we had to leave the office, we said, look, we're going to stand by you guys and keep you informed. I wrote, personally, I wrote quite a lengthy successes email every single day that I sent to all staff just to say, look, this is some people picking up jobs. This is happening and some good work. Just really try and spread the cheer, some sunshine emails, but to, to ensure that they were getting communicated from by the company every single day. Um, but then also, yeah, we, we did all of the other engagement bits and pieces too. So, yeah, we had to really lean into just constant communication. And we took decision to furlough as few people as possible. Almost uh, they, it was when people could basically not work through childcare issues and their mark completely died. We, so we, we furloughed a handful, but we said, actually, for this next three to six months, however long this lockdown lasts, we want you to be on our L&D system, online learning, because we've got over 100 hours of video on there, um, just to really improve yourself. And um, we set one of these 135s that we said, um, just for the pre, pre and post pandemic, where we said, we want to come out of this pandemic in a better shape than we went in. We want to be like a coiled spring, learning as much as we can, improving um, processes. We thought we'd come out with higher engagement, which means you know you get all that discretionary effort from your staff. And I truly believe that happened. So come uh, sort of uh, August, September, when things start returning, we came back to the office, we were we were at it. And I think that's probably one of the best decisions we've ever made as a business. Yeah, I love that. What about the second lockdown? How did that affect you? Um, yeah, I mean, in, in, in terms of people's desire to, to be in or out, we, we've just found that, you know, people just don't like change, essentially. You know, pe- people didn't want to go home in, in March. They, you know, it, it was tough to get people all back in in, in, in September. Um, November, everyone was gutted to go home. But, you know, this this time around, you know, we, we are lucky, I suppose, or, you know, I don't necessarily love that word, but we are lucky in terms of, mo- you know, that we've got a huge local authority client base. Um, and, you know, there, there were, you know, I mean, there were, there, there was a contractor that worked for a, um, a local authority in London that actually ended up going back to Australia and carrying on his contract, um, wow. you know, or, you know, obviously remotely. So, you know, in, in, in terms of, in terms of that, it, it, it was fairly stable. You know, we, we, we've got a huge number of contractors, which obviously helps, helps on the business, but there, there have been financial hardships, but, you know, as, as, as James mentioned, we didn't call upon a huge amount of assistance from the government. One, because we didn't need to, and that's obviously not the right, not the right thing to do. And, and two, um, in, in a lot of our emerging markets, um, you know, the, the established competitors were, 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 were furloughing people, you know, and if those guys make 30 calls a day into their market and we make 33, you can imagine it takes, it takes 10 days to just catch up, you know, e- e- even on a single day. So to have them off work for, for two or three months mm. and us and us backing ourselves and keep going, you, you know, the huge strides that can be made in that time um, was, was, was untold. And then, um, you know, November was actually our, it, we, we've beaten it now, but I think November James was our record month ever. Yeah. It was our um, record ever month in per contract and so, um, yeah it was brilliant and then we've beaten that in january and march so yeah. yeah what what about the working processes so if you were all in the office i imagine with the local authority they were quite traditional in their way of working pre-pandemic have have your clients adopted this remote access and is it all video enabled still or is it can you see it moving back to where it was now that we're I, um i think everybody's video enabled some of the so the uh larger consultancies they're all being very careful about kind of asking people to go back but a lot of the engineering work that we recruit for that can be done remotely um mm. there, there was obviously site work which never really stopped anyway not, not hugely um, and so we can see that carrying on that doesn't really affect us um but i think more in general i think people do miss the office and i think there's a certain type of people or percentage of people that need that interaction i think recruitment's one of those you need that collaboration. You can't sit at home without it. And you can't build a company or a desk without that. And culture is going to start suffering. 
Um, but yeah, I'll, um, to answer your question, yeah, I think the clients, uh, they're going to slowly return, but it won't be as it was. It will be hybrid. I think that's what they really Do you think it'll be more efficient, though, for your teams to have that? Like you said, Sai, you've got eight, uh, eight meetings a day or whatever now. Do you think, like, getting back on trains and whatever to, and driving to client meetings, is? do you want your teams to go back to that or do you, do you prefer well, it? I mean, you know, traditionally, and certainly when we were at our old workplace, that was, you know, and that, that was even sort of pre-LinkedIn and pre-CV library. You know, this is how this is how relationships are, uh, are essentially built in, in, you know, lunches, face-to-face, referrals. Um, so I don't think it can ever replace it. Um, I, I think you may get, a yes to a to 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 a client meeting for someone that probably was never going to meet you face to face, um, you know, because they 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 feel more comfortable in just in just being able to switch the you know the screen off after ten minutes, um, but you know from, from my side and we we we, you know, we certainly haven't discussed this yet in terms of policy, but you know I'd I'd like to see a certainly a hybrid model on that. You know, and and try and and try and maybe try and maybe look at you know reducing the number of calls we expect and and kind of up in the number of face to face conversations as a as a as a little thing we could look at. But you know, but still having quality face to face, um, you know, kind of yeah. you know, kind of meetings. I think and one one of our jobs as as in, in recruitment or sales is you've got to build relationships. That's probably almost the most important thing. That's how that's why your client chooses you over everybody else. So you know, we can all claim to have the same. Um, perfect CRM and access to job boards and LinkedIn, but it's the relationships and you can't create relationships without conversation and communication doesn't equal conversation. Communication via email or even WhatsApp, that doesn't build rapport. Even a video chat. So you'll jump on a video chat with a client and you've got 15 minutes. It is generally, you've got an agenda, it's work chat, um, which doesn't really build a relationship as well. It's obviously better than just the phone, but Face to face is how you build relationships, right? And uh, you know that walk between the office and the car park, or even if you do take them out to lunch and they have a moan about their other halves or something. Uh, you know, it's these little, little bits and pieces that actually help build build a client base for us. And um, and you can actually start becoming friends with your clients and candidates, which is kind of something we'd always encourage because you know we're here for the long term. Yeah, I'm just, and I'm, 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 I'm just going to sure, sure, I'm just going to just add to that just quick. Quite a lot of our success has also been built on actual sort of social events, like large, large gatherings of our contractors. And you, you know, we've got a summer thing. Fingers crossed that can take place this year. We do, you know, we do a Christmas thing, and and I think that's now become like a a thing that people really look forward to in in, in, in kind of value. So we're hoping that this year that can, you know, these sorts of things can go ahead again. You know, yeah. I mean, I I can just see the next ten years being very different i think the i think that i completely agree that the face-to-face is, is the holy grail but i think it will become rarer and rarer personally i just think the, even Maybe. with even with the pandemic ending i just think it'll, efficiencies people are just driving efficiency into their life now more than yeah. ever before they're optimizing every minute they can and you know that's going to change just the way people want to do but even if it even if it means you miss out on a few things. I think business will be different. But um, what is the vision? What is the vision now? So you're at 60-ish people, right? You're 10 years old. Amazing milestone. Exciting. Super mm-hmm. exciting. You're out. Well, hopefully, we're on the other side of, you know, a horrendous year. You guys have – looks like you've held strong based on the sectors. Um, James, what's the what's the future look like for you? So so uh, vision for this year is we, we – um... I, I well, I've given us a bit of a, a B hack, big, hairy, audacious goal of growing by fifty percent in revenue uh, yes. this year, year on year. Uh, we're on track after one quarter, but it's just one quarter. Things could <laughs> really go wrong in quarter two, three, and four. But um, so that that's our vision for this year. Then probably another thirty percent growth next year. So we want to get up to 70, 75 heads by the end of this year, um, and uh, by a hundred in within two to three years time so we've got that goal we want to get the revenue up to certain levels um and we've got an office where we can fit 100 people right now which we moved into two years ago um and we've been able to get people back safely because we have such a large office we can socially distance with all the desks we want to fill the office we want to we want to continue to to do well by our by our staff um and you know really increase our brand awareness so that's something we're focusing on our, our 2021 vision, the, the leadership team, which we shared with everybody, 
has our people first in, in our statement is we want to create, we want to be the best employer we possibly can be. And that's, that's what we're focusing on because we feel if you do that well and treat your staff that well, they're going to give great service to your clients. If they give great service to your clients, we're going to build some money. That allows us to get more people in. And then if we can invest in our people, treat them well, we'll get better clients. And you get this fly rule going around. Um, and it's just going to keep getting faster and faster because you can't help but give great service if you've got great and happy people. And if you give great service, you can't help but grow your business. Um, so that's our focus is is still on our people. I don't think you can ever do enough and you, you um, should never stop. You've never completed it. What? What I want to know about it, I, I, I'm not, I don't know your financial situation, but I imagine you guys are in a more comfortable position than you were 10 years ago. You're not driving that car around, I hope, so. I really, <laughs> no, I know, yeah. I really no, hope. No. Got, right? no. Although, although I did get a clamp yesterday, so that sort of, um, that, that <laughs> kind of took me back a bit. Yeah, well, that, you can afford a clamp. Come on, you can afford. Yeah. You're, you're, yeah. You're, 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 so, why, why carry on with this grand? Like, you've got to 60, you know, million pound, multi million pound business, you know. <laughs> Winning awards. I can see the driver 10 years ago. Mm. I asked James Kahn this question. I've asked, you know, I've asked every interview. I love this question because yeah. I think I get a slightly different, but there's always a similar theme. So I think why, why yeah. are you still doing this? And why do you want to why do you want to get to 100? What's the point? Like, why is it going to change your life? It's a, it's a great question. When we set this business up, it, it was for us two or three years in, it's no longer for us. And I think mm. that's where a lot of founders and business owners tend to get a bit confused is is that what they're creating is no longer we're, we're, we're almost custodians of Carrington yeah. West now so it's our duty to make it the best company it possibly can be yeah Sorry, and, and, and yeah no and that's it and, and I think you know this I've, I've just recently taken on a, a kind of new new sort of business coaching forum um that, that i'm now a member of and and uh ed, kind of uh, ed mylet who's, who's like one of the main guys in there he he yeah. talks about uh, blissful dissatisfaction and it's really something that actually i've realized that we've been practicing for for probably five or six years you know and 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 anyone that's just due to start out and they've got grand plans like this you know you need to become good at being happy uh, with the progress, but you need to be, you know, ha have that sort of happy but dissatisfied kind of outlook. You know, if you, if you, I'll, I'll be happy when, I'll be happy when. That that's that's not obviously going to serve anyone. Um, but to but to obviously keep making these kind of milestones and keep achieving them, you you need to be kind of in a dissatisfied but happy state kind of the whole time. And I think that's kind of where we've been. Um, yeah. But yeah, just to go back to the previous point, I think um, you know. Uh, we we owe it to the guys that we've got here. We owe it to the guys that we want to attract. We're recruiting heavily. Um, up until the other day, we had vacancies for, I believe, 12 to 15 people. I don't know where we currently stand with that one. Um, we've got two people starting in the next two days. So, you know, we owe it to these people to not just go, we're done. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's you know, there, there, is a, there is a driver in us. Um, not to just keep talking about kind of heads, but there's a driver in us to, 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 to be the best um, and and to and to create a culture that sort of transcends recruitment and and tra you know we just want to create a culture that um, especially in a sector where people are, are are in a niche sector you know as James mentioned we've you know we keep our consultants for years rather than months sometimes you know a decade so you know J J Blaine's coming up for all, all, almost ten years if he's here to, for ten years and the sector in which he deals in is inch wide mile deep which is another thing we talk about you know he's now he's now a stakeholder in that industry that happens to be a recruiter mm. and that's what we want all of our people to be we want them to be stakeholders in their industry um and we can't talk about this and, and then you know sort of semi just tread water it, it's something that we need to follow through and and, and see through yeah. for, obviously for these guys yeah and I, I'm, I'm just excited to see what more we can do i think that's what drives me it's like we, we're we're a better company today than we were yesterday and we've ever been so if we've achieved what we've achieved over the last 10 years Boy, what, what are we going to do in the next 10? That excites me. That's I'm thinking, this is great. Like We're breaking records almost every week here with our, our, our sort of revenue and billings-wise because we've just got some of the best people over the pa pandemic. They upskilled. So now we've got even better people who are more engaged. We, we, our hiring processes and onboarding processes are getting better and better. I'm excited to um, to see what we can what we can achieve. And as Simon said, um, Quite often, well, people say, "Oh, you must be really proud, really happy with that." 
um, with what you've achieved. I'm like, no, like I haven't achieved it yet. We're still on the journey. Um, and so that's what that's what drives us. Is that yeah? Is there any? We, we, we're never goal? done. Is there an end goal? Is there is there a point where you think yeah that might actually be the time we we, we both? I think drink? if I can afford an island um, somewhere <laughs> uh, just to relax. But I think I think I'd go. I'd be bored to death. Um, I don't. I could never really retire. Whether I'm doing this exact same role for this company for forever, you know, probably not. But um, yeah, I, there's yeah. As, as it stands, we, we're just on the journey, and we're just trying to enjoy it? that as well. How has this ten years? And this is quite a personal question. Affected your personal life positively or negatively, or both? And I'll ask that either of you can answer that. Yeah. Um... <sighs> I don't think any of us are in the same relationships that we started the company in, put it that way. I think, I think well, in, in, in the exception of Alex. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it's not been easy. There have been some times where you, I, I've looked back and I've gone, God, I was in the right state there. Um, and, and I didn't, you know, know it at the time. Um, you know, these days I can, you know, tend to take a bit more pragmatic, kind of pragmatic view about stress. I tend to sort of step off a bit. You know, that we have got, you know, a middle management that we can call on. Um, and, you know, I've just had two children and, 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 you know, th things have, things have changed in that sense, but um, yeah, it's, it's been, it's been tough and, um, you know, uh, yeah. not I, I, I think, yeah, I, um, I personally feel I've, I've probably sacrificed quite a lot of my um, personal life for the business. And, um, you know, when we started there, no one was talking about wellness, work-life balance, blend or anything like that. And, and I felt it was my duty to the business, to Simon and only staff we brought in, to, to give 110%, which didn't often leave much for, for myself. So probably, probably sacrificed a lot of your own wellness, mental health, physical wellness and things to just throwing everything in. But that's, that's what's driven us. And I don't think that's right. And I, and I hope that the next generation of people, and we're trying to really inject that into our staff, it's not all about work. As much as we'd like to have a load of people out there that, that destroy their personal life for us, um, we want, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we want that them. I like that's the one. I, th I think I think that's the new tagline for Wellbeing Week yeah. next year. <laughs> yeah. We would want you to have no life, but we know yeah. you need. That's the but no, like, uh, obviously, obviously, yeah. Can we delete that? Um, but you know, it's, it's so life. <laughs> we, we are trying to we try and like sort of force people to take holidays and to get this balance because. Having a, a happy, balanced workforce um, who are mentally sound and physically well, they're going to, again, be better people, better at their jobs, and it'd be a more envi uh, enjoyable environment. So hopefully I can um, learn from maybe what Sai and I, and I know the other directors have kind of sacrificed to sort of say it doesn't actually have to be that way, and I think the world's changed a little bit in the last 10 years anyway. Well, guys, I have absolutely loved this chat you've made me laugh you've you've inspired me as well i mean we're four years in so i learn from every one of these conversations i see i can empathize with so much that you've said um final question is i'm gonna ask you both one question right so um if i if 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 simon if you had to give one piece of advice to a, a co-founder starting a business with it with it with a colleague like you did yeah what would it be i um based on the I, relationship with the person how do you maintain a relationship for 10 years that's that's right i see what you mean um i think you've got to really pick your business partner very carefully you know wh wh whether you know it or not at the time um as we've proved you know this could be probably the key relationship you know uh, you know that you'll have um so I, I i think it's just to be be able to talk frankly to each other ensure your ensure your skills um complement each other and and be able to just be completely honest and, and i think you know you we, we, you throw that line away as if it if as if you know it's almost a catchphrase but you know in the past for me being you know telling people straight has been a real issue for me um but with but with me and james it's and a, and a few other key relationships in my life these days I, I i've sort of found that and i think that's absolutely you know absolutely key um you know what i will say is i've you know we are 10 years in and i have sort of reached the stage where i am keen to help others so i've got more advice than just just one piece and if people want to find me on 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 linkedin or, or through you guys or maybe on instagram you know i'm, I'm always yes. you know I'm, I'm always keen to help um 
obviously it's got to be a non-competing uh, kind of area. Um, <laughs> however, um, I, I'm yeah, I, I think probably on Instagram is the best thing, and just DM me on there, and, I, and I'm and I'm happy to help. But yeah, we, we, uh, yeah. On... what's that? Sorry, what's your handle on Instagram? So it's at sci dot gardner dot mm, which um, right. uh, yeah, so sci dot gardner dot mm. Um, right. But um, but yeah, I, I, and and hopefully. You know, I mean, as I said, it's it's not just you know, kind of me and James and how we compliment each other. It's it's Nick and Alex and how they compliment each other. It's Blaine and it's Gavin and it's Joe and it's how we compliment each other as a team. But I think full and frank honesty is is the is the is the priority. And James, same question to you. Um, I I think Simon and I, well, we, we've obviously had a couple of bust ups, but it's actually been quite quite plain, plain sailing, really. Yeah. Um, but I think it's because we've got the same vision and values. And it's so it's easy. Like we've I've used this analogy before. We're on a train going somewhere. It doesn't really matter who's collecting the tickets, um, who's driving the train, whatever. You know where you're going, so your decisions are easier. And um, you know, it might be that side to side he wants to sort of do do a bit of a, a lap of one station. I want to go a different way, but we know where we're ending up. So those discussions our motive is kind of right that you know we remove the person from the decision and say look i feel this would be the best way let's have an open discussion about it but if your values and your vision are aligned it's actually quite straightforward so make sure that's true because you, you can imagine if two people one's maybe a little bit more um nefarious in some of their dealings and, and the other one has a bit more integrity it just wouldn't work because you'd be bashing into each other and it would be uncomfortable so if they're aligned um, I think that makes for a much happier and, and productive relationship. Totally, totally agree with that and love that. Guys, thank you. It's been a been a pleasure. It's an hour and two minutes. It's just gone like like that. I'm yeah. sure we could have carried on all day. Um Sai, you've already been so kind to say that. James, if anyone does reach out to you, I'm sure you'd be happy. If of course, it... yeah. Always happy to help other people. Yeah. yeah. I feel like um yeah. I've been on a really big journey over the last 10 years, lots of audio books and trying to soak up as much information as possible. So yeah, feel free to reach out. Wicked. I'll make sure you're both tagged on LinkedIn on, on all the comms and obviously you'll be sharing this as well. Um, okay. And guys, listening, thank you so much for your time. Thanks again for your attention. We weren't around last week, unfortunately. I did have a week off, so I had a break from the show. But I'm back. I'm booked till July, I think now. So we will be every single week. We're not. We normally get to 25 episodes, and we have a break. We're not doing that this time. We're going right through um, in season four. Um, and and I say this every week. If you if you've listened to the show and you've listened to James and Ty and you've you've found it inspirational, please don't keep it to yourself. Share it with someone you know. Put it out on text, WhatsApp, email, whatever. Um, because I, I truly believe that together, this industry, regardless of competition, together, we're learning from each other, we're stronger. We got through the pandemic incredibly well. You know, my I'm, I'm coaching 3,000 recruiters right now on how to build a brand. And, you know, the, the, the way they're all excited about the market, every day we're on calls. And I feel like they're all busy. You know, they're, they're, they're bouncing back. It's been incredible. But let's use it now as an opportunity in 2021 to take it to the next level. And I think this show um, and introducing people like Cy and James, you know, every week you've got an opportunity to, to learn from the best in the industry. Um, so I'll be back again next Wednesday with another founder's story. In the meantime, you stay safe and I'll see you soon.